Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Rasha Alami. I'm an interventional cardiologist and an incoming deputy editor at Jack. And it's my absolute pleasure today to be joined by Bernard De Bruyne, a professor of cardiology at the Cardiovascular Centre in Aust, and his fellow, uh, Tabo Mahendran, who's uh, also working on coronary physiology and research out in Aust. Thank you both for joining us today. It's Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you very much. So here we are today to discuss uh, one of your papers, uh, which will be presented at uh, your PCR in Paris. Um, and we were absolutely delighted that you sent it to us in Jack. And um, this really covers um, a very important topic, the microcirculation, and specifically the role of a new index, the microvascular resistance reserve. So maybe, uh, Bernard, you can talk to us about why you felt that this study was important. Yeah, thank you very, very much, uh, Rasha. So, um, you, as we all know, coronary flow reserve, which was introduced already uh, 40 years ago by Lance Gold, um, this coronary flow reserve is widely used to diagnose coronary microvascular dysfunction. It's a little bit paradoxical because Lance Gold introduced that as an index of epicardial disease, but okay, I close the parenthesis. So, uh, coronary flow reserve is now widely used for CMD and to more broadly, to assess the function of the microvasculature. However, we have to re remember that it is an aspecific index. It takes into account the epicardial resistance and the microvascular resistance. When we are interested in knowing how the microvasculature functions in a patient, well, of course, we are interested in only the microvascular function. And we very often assume that the epicardial resistance is absent. And we all know that this is very often not the case. And we all know that these patients very often have a 30% there, 20% there, 50% there. Also in the guidelines, it is suggested to test the microcirculation in patients with epicardial disease up to 50% diameter stenosis. 50% diameter stenosis by eyeballing, this can be anything between a fractional flow reserve of almost one to a fractional flow reserve of 0.6. So the presence of epicardial resistance is very important, very frequent and massively underestimated. And that is the reason why we introduced a couple of months or years ago, the concept or the index of microvascular resistance reserve. It's a MRR, a little bit difficult to pronounce, but it should be seen as a kind of super CFR. It's a CFR adjusted for the epicardial resistance. And what is the best index for the epicardial resistance? Well, it's the FFR. So it's simply a CFR adjusted for FFR. And for another term, I won't go into the details right now, but it is, again, at the risk of repeating what I say, CFR corrected, taking into account the epicardial resistance. That's a little bit the background of microvascular resistance reserve and this concept. Thank you, Bernard. So maybe, um, Tabo, you can talk to us. This was a very difficult study to do, but maybe if you just talk to us about what you did. Sure, with pleasure. So th this was a, a mechanistic study trying to illustrate the point that Bernard just mentioned. So we didn't need many patients for it as a result. Essentially, we recruited 16 patients that had approximate LAD stenosis that underwent stentin. And we then went on to test these concepts by inflating a semi-compliant balloon within the LAD stent um, to different grades, essentially creating a mild, moderate, and a severe stenosis. And we did this all whilst measuring continuous, um, measuring absolute coronary flow using continuous thermodilution. Um, and by doing this, we were able to calculate CFR and MRR for each grade of stenosis. I don't know if it's useful for us to give a bit of introduction to continuous thermodilution or not. Um, you can the... certainly do that for our radio, uh, for our listeners. Yeah. Just just because I, I I imagine lots of viewers might be unfamiliar with the concepts, but continuous thermodilution is something developed by Bernard and Nico Pels, um, and essentially uses a dedicated infusion microcatheter that's positioned in the proximal artery that infuses saline at a dedicated uh, infusion rate, and a standard pressure temperature wire placed distally. Um, and by doing this, and through the principle of thermodilution, it lets us um, calculate absolute coronary flow and absolute microvascular resistance at the level of the infusion catheter, just as a bit of background for what we use it. Yeah. So maybe, Tabo, you can tell us what you found. 
So the, the, the results are quite simple. Uh, essentially, what we found was that um, with increased in stenosis severity, CFR decreased markedly and in a linear fashion, as would go along with the theory, whereas MRR remained stable across all stenosis grades, essentially highlighting that it was a specific index for the microvascular compartment. And maybe we can talk now, Tabo, to some of the... So you, you mentioned the fact that this was quite a small study. Do you think that this study uh, needs to be repeated? Does it need bigger, bigger sample size or do you think it was enough? So personally, I think it was enough. I, I don't think there's really a, a sample size calculation that you can do for this sort of thing. Um, it's the, the, the goal of this whole study was to demonstrate a physiological principle. And honestly, it became apparent after just a few patients and um, 16, we eventually stopped that. But it was very, very clear that CFR decreased with stenosis severity and MRR remained to stay the same across all stenosis severity. So in terms of sample size, certainly not, wouldn't need to be repeated. And, and maybe Bernard, you could speak to us about, do you think this is vessel dependent or do you think it's enough to be, again, with the sample size to be able to extrapolate this to all vessels in all situations? Yeah, that's a very good question. You're right. Actually, this is certainly not vessel dependent. Based on the theory, you will find exactly the same LED circumflex right. Now, if we discuss this at a somewhat broader level, I think that microvascular disease should be, at least in the cat lab, studied each time in the same vessel, which is the LED. It's very important to be uh, to reproduce each time the same thing in order to standardize all these measurements. And we all these measurements in this study was performed in the LED, but also in daily practice, we do never measure anything. Uh, in another vessel than in the LED when it comes to microvascular assessment. It's better to have a very good measurement in the LED than a little bit sloppy measurements in all the vessels, which are, are then confusing. There is another point. The LED vascularizes a mass of mica, which is, of course, very big, but surprisingly, which is also relatively constant, does not vary too much from patient to patient much less than the right and much less than the circumflex. So that's another argument to go always to the circumflex and to do always the same thing. And so maybe Bernard, you can tell us and kind of really for, for those people out there who are kind of confused, they say there's many, many different physiological indices. Of course, you and your team have been very much uh, instrumental in developing many of them. What should we be using in the lab and how do we distill this now? Yeah. That's again a very good question. There is, uh, there is indeed a profusion of uh, indices, both for the epicardial vessel and the microcirculation. The microcirculation even is even worse. For the epicardial vessels, the big coronary arteries that we see on the angiogram, uh, above 400 micrometers, I think that nowadays we have pressure measurements. There are many companies producing wires. All of them are extremely reliable. Many of the the small uh, problems that we had to face in the beginning are solved. There are two family of indices which are important. The first one, it's not a family, it's a single one, is fractional flow reserve, the distal pressure divided by aortic pressure during maximal hyperemia. And then there is a family of non-hyperemic pressure ratios, IFR, RFR, just to name a few of them. They are okay but their quality, their accuracy is a little bit less than fractional flow reserve. And not inducing hyperemia is for me a kind of lack of uh, clinical curiosity because it gives us for free a kind of window towards the microcirculation. So that is for the epicardial vessels, fractional flow reserve and HPR. For the microvasculature, it's indeed a little bit more complicated simply because it's a compartment which is very complicated to understand. We have seen and we have discussed already previously, of course, we are used to CFR and IMR, both derived most often from bolus thermodilution and very often needed to be interpreted in conjunction, not only CFR, not only IMR, but has to be interpreted in conjunction to, with each other. And then now we have introduced something which is, in our opinion, much more specific, which is MRR and the absolute microvascular resistance all being derived 
from continuous thermodilution. This is what I would call the Rolls Royce of the microvascular um, function assessment. It's a little bit more cumbersome, takes a little bit more time, it's a little bit more expensive, needs a little bit more habit. It's not as fast, but it's way more reproducible and way more accurate, even when comparing that. So CFR, IMR, and even better, MRR and the absolute resistance. Fantastic. Well, look, that leaving us on the Rolls Royce um, for physiological assessment in the cath lab is probably the best place to end. Thank you both for joining us today and thank you both for submitting your excellent science to Jack. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.